Well, look, this morning, many people are waking up to the very sad news that Terry Wogan, the Limerick-born broadcaster, has died at the age of 77 after a short battle with cancer. One of the greatest broadcasters of all time, his career spanned over 50 years. Here's a clip now of Terry when he was signing off from his incredibly popular daily BBC Radio 2 show in 2009. This is it then. This is the day I've been dreading. The inevitable morning when you and I come to the parting of the ways. The old, the last, wake up to Wogan. Uh, it wasn't always thus for the first 12 years. It was the plain old Terry Wogan show and you were all twits. The Terry Wogan is top society. And when I returned to the bosom of our family, it became wake up to Wogan. And you all became togs, Terry's old geezers and gals. It's always been a source of enormous pride to me that uh, you've come together in my name, that you're proud to call yourselves my listeners, that you think of me as a friend, someone that you're close enough to laugh with, to poke fun at, and occasionally, when the world seemed just a little too cruel, to shed a tear with. And the years together with you have not only been a pleasure, but a privilege. You've allowed me to share your lives with you. When you tell me how important I've been in your lives, it's very moving. You've been every bit as important in mine. We've been through at least a couple of generations together. For many of you, your children, like mine, now have children of their own. And your support for children in need has been consistent and magnificent. You've baked the bakes, you've held the quizzes, you've sold the calendars, you've packed the CDs and the DVDs. You've answered the phones, always there when we've called on you, unheralded and unsung. And if anybody embodies the generous, warm spirit of this country. It's you, my listener. Now, I'm not going to pretend that this is not a sad day. You probably hear it in my voice. I'm going to miss the laughter and the fun of our mornings together. So, I'm going to miss you. Till we're together again, thank you. Thank you for being my friend. The late Terry Wogan there speaking in 2009. I'm now joined on the line by Gay Byrne. Gay Byrne, thank you so much, first of all, for joining us. Your thoughts this morning, Gay? Well, I'm very, very sad, obviously. It didn't come as a great surprise because we knew that he, had a, he was out of sorts and was ill. I didn't know quite the nature of the illness, but we knew that he was not well, and so we were expecting this day. Not quite so soon, may I say, but anyway, there you are. That was it. I've already talked to Dave Fanning uh, with uh, Ryan Tuberty on Dave's program this morning, and Ryan was talking about Terry's great generosity to him when he started going over to the BBC and London, and Terry was very quick about saying to him, if there's anything you need, anything you want, any help you want, I'm here, give me a tinkle, I can fix it for you pretty well, and if I can't, I know a fellow who can fix it for you. That kind of kindness and, and thoughtfulness. And so I remember him, and, and I repeat what I said today, that the one point I always made about Terry and to Terry was that he was, he was born with a monster advantage over the rest of us, which was that he was born with a permanently sunny disposition. <laughs> he simply was optimistic, and he was good-natured, and he was... He saw the fun in everything, and this is a huge gift to have because the rest of us, to a great extent, to a great extent, the rest of us go through looking at what's wrong with the world and what's wrong with ourselves and what's wrong with other people, and we tend to get grumpy and bad-tempered and so on. He didn't seem to have that capacity. He thought, saw fun in everything, and he saw a joke in everything, and he was just, just expecting the best, and the best usually happened. And, and he was just one of those guys, and he had this quirky sense of humor, which people have described as, as surreal. Uh, other people have just described it as bizarre, but he could see the quirky fun in things. And he got that, I am convinced, from a man called Dennis Meehan, who was the chief announcer in the old radio era, in which we all knew and loved on the second floor of the GPO in the side entrance in, in Henry Street and up in the lift. And Dennis me and Terry mixed and, and was in his company a good deal, more than the rest of us who went in, more than Mike and more than Brendan Balf and, and more than I was and, and so on. And he picked up this sort of outlook, this, this Miles Nagopoline outlook mm-hmm. 
this Kruskin lawn outlook on things. And that's what he used on his, on his radio programmes and in, in his television programmes. Remind the listener, Gay, how long you knew Terry. Can you remember when you first met him? Well, it, 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 it's a bit confusing because I, I went in earlier than the others, earlier than Mike and, and before Brendan Balfe and before Terry and so on. And by the time Terry came into the GPO, I was already going out every week to Granada Television in Manchester. I left on Monday and came back on Thursday. I was still in around the place, but not nearly as much as the others. And therefore, Mike and Brendan Balfe and, and one or two others, probably Larry Gogan, would have more immediate memories of Terry than I did. But, but he, he was renowned for his sense of humor. He was renowned for his sense of fun. He was, he was the one who, who regularly would play tricks on newcomers coming in on their auditions and, and so on. Mm-hmm. Like uh, on, your first new, uh, on first re- reading, your first news cast, he would creep into the studio and start untying the two laces on your shoes and tie them to the opposite <laughs> shoe. And, and he was renowned for doing this. And while you were reading live on the air, and you were full of nerves anyway, he, he would do this. And you wondered what he was doing because it never happened to you before. And then, of course, when you stood up, you fell over. So, so he was full of that kind of pranky sense of humor. And, and everybody loved him. But the point I make about him is that I think you, you refer to this in your introduction. He probably was the most popular and the most listened to broadcaster mm. in the world, insofar as not only did he have his UK listenership to his morning program, but that went right over the whole continent of Europe. And he had a huge listenership right across Europe. So he, was, he had more listeners than all the rest of us combined, if you like, mm. uh, to his morning program. And I keep on making the point that that it starts with the voice. People tend to dismiss the fact that he had a lovely voice and, a, and, and it produced a lovely sound, a lovely round, mellow sound. And it started there because people found it attractive to listen to. Hmm. And that was honed and perfected in reading news bulletins in the old radio era by the same Dennis Meehan and to a lesser extent Bridget Kilfeather, who was a demon on pronunciation mm-hmm. and correct name places and so on. And, and so he learned his craft and he perfected his craft in the old radio era. <clears throat> I think he would have said that himself to you if, had, he, had he the opportunity. As well as that voice, uh, Gay, what else do you think set him apart to make him such a great broadcaster? What were the other qualities you believe qualities made him were, that? <clears throat> the other qualities were, A, he was extremely well read. He had, he had the good, he wasn't a Christian Brothers boy, but he had a good grounding in, in, in I think, the Maris Brothers or, or, or whatever he, he, he was schooled. And, and he had a good grounding in, in, in Shakespeare and poetry and all of that sort of thing. But he, he maintained that interest throughout his entire life. And that stood to him because he could throw in <clears throat> various uh, uh, quotations and so on um, to, to fit the bill. And, and um, uh, secondly, he was just, he, he, he got around a lot and he knew a lot of people and, and he, he made his own of the Eurovision Song Contest, of course. He was the first one to, to start mocking mm. the, the, the Eurovision Song Contest, for which he was roundly hated by large groups of people who took the Eurovision Song Contest extremely seriously and, and who kept on criticizing him on the basis that if he doesn't like the Eurovision Song Contest, why does he keep on doing it? Which, of course, was to miss the entire point. It was that he loved the Eurovision Song Contest, <laughs> but he saw the ridiculousness of yeah. it and the nonsense of it and the, the whole build-up of it and the participation of so many people in this tawdry, tatty sort of show business mm. thing. And, and he was the one who started to, first of all, make a mockery of it in his, in his commentary. But from your point of view, Gay, I remember seeing the programme he made a few years back on Ireland, his Ireland for the BBC, and you were in that. And I remember watching the two of you, the pair of you going around Ireland. And there seemed to be not just maybe, you know, respect for each other as great broadcasters, but a genuine affection between the pair of you. Well, the, we, were, we were fond of each other. I think mm. he was fond of me. I was certainly very, very fond of him and a great respecter of him and a great admirer of him indeed. But on that occasion, we did include 
in that part of the tour, we both went back to the old Radio Ireland place, yeah. in the side entrance, Henry Street, up on the lift and so on, and we walked again down that long corridor, which we both had known extremely well in our day, because off the corridor lay the offices of all of those officers, I'll mm. have you know, officers. <laughs> there was the light music officer, and there was the features <laughs> officer, and there was the sponsored program officer, <laughs> because all of the employees in there were actually employees of Unpost, the Department of Post and Telegraphs. And, and so we walked again down the long corridor and up the stairs to the upstairs studio and so on, and we, it, 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 there was no similarity between what we saw and what we remembered all those years ago, but nonetheless, the corridor was still there, and the the immediate surroundings were still the same. So we reminisced on that occasion, like two very old gentlemen. No, I loved watching that. Stay with us, Gay. I'm joined by Brendan Bath. Brent, Brendan, thank you very much for joining us. I gather he trained you. Is that correct, Brendan? Uh, that's true, Mary. He was my boss. Uh, he was the chief announcer. Uh, Janice Meehan was the station supervisor. Cherry was the chief announcer. And uh, he, he trained me along with Janice and along with Bridget Clefeather. So we were, we were pals and comrades, but also I was his employee to some extent. Um, and a charming man, as my wife always said, full of sunshine, a sunny disposition all the time. Um, as Gay also said, they're extremely well read. He was like Dennis Meehan. Dennis Meehan was into Flann O'Brien and S.J. Perelman and James Stevens and those people. Well, they used to have these, these quite fantastic conversations about nothing in particular, but just surreal stream of consciousness, Joycean conversations. And that's where Terry got the, I presume, this slightly offbeat and surreal sense of humour. But a, a wonderful and charming man. And despite all his success in the United Kingdom, Brendan, he never seemed to change. Like you and Gay would have known him from very early days. He didn't seem to change, did he? Well, that was, that's always the, the, the mark of a great broadcaster, that, that, that they are pretty much the same on the air as they are off the air. Mm. And, and, you know, on, on radio, a little bit more tidied up, but essentially you're the same person. And, 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 and uh, I remember asking uh, somebody in RT years ago why he hired some person and not the other. And he said, well, there's a, there's a rule which I use and nobody else uses, but it's the rule is this. Um, nice people come over as nice people and bastards come over as bastards and there's nothing you can do about it. So there, there is a something about the real man <laughs> which was transmitted to his, his, his listeners, not only in Ireland, but also also. Around and Britain and, and Europe as well. You like that guy? He was terribly fond of Larry Gogan. Terry was. Yes, terribly that's right. Fond yeah, of Larry Gogan. Up, yeah, that's come true. And, uh, and Larry of, of him too. So you, 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 you could do with getting a word from Larry. He start, he'd be on 2FM later on in the, in the day. Okay. But you could, you could certainly do with getting a word from Larry. Yeah. And also, people, he often spoke about, I mean, the importance of Helen, his wife. I mean, I suppose I'll put this to you, Gay. When he went to the UK and made such a big name for himself, he never lost his roots. And that probably was also because he was married to the girl he knew when he was young and nothing ever changed there. Yes. Now, we're, Kathleen and I are thinking of Helen this morning. Mm-hmm. She must be absolutely you know, all feeling dreadful and the, and the rest of the family. But... But, um, yes, he remained stuck to Ireland. He remained uh, that, that he wanted to be reminded of Ireland. He, he did love coming back here and visiting the place and so on. And he had great ties to Ireland. So he never lost that bit of it uh, either. But he, he said a, a very strange thing to me. He said throughout the entire troubles with the IRA and bombs and threats of bombs in England, and so, he never got a nasty letter. Mm. Which is which is extraordinary. He's, yeah. he, I remember him very very uh, strongly saying that to me that he never got any outburst of of blame or or contempt or nastiness from from um, British um, listeners to mm. his program or British viewers, which is quite quite extraordinary. One of the the things that uh, he always said, and indeed Eamon Andrews said before him, the the Irish the Irish accent is sort of classless, and his mm-hmm. listeners couldn't quite figure out where in the stratum of society he came from. So that's why one of the, one of the reasons for his appeal is the accent, of course, it's an Irish accent, but they're not quite sure is that upper class or lower class didn't know, and that also helped. And he also did what Dennis Meehan always did, assume the listeners are bright. In other words, mm-hmm. uh, give them the respect of having a brain. And he always aimed high for them. He, he aimed at a slightly... Well, a higher level than, 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 say, pop DJs would aim. He always said to me that um, 
I said, if only one professor uh, cycling to Oxford with his gown billowing out behind him on the bicycle, if only one of them like him gets the illusion I've made, <laughs> I'm perfectly happy. Yeah. And because he could slip into Greek if, and Latin every, every now and again. Uh, and as Gay said, terribly well read. Knew, knew his stuff, if you like. Um, and and, 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 and uh, as a, a generous, irreverent, as, as I've often told you, my, my, my very first encounter, my very first day announcing, uh, opening the station in Irish and English, he poured a jug of water over my head to, <laughs> as, by, by way of initiation, he said afterwards. <laughs> it Brent, just makes up a long, boring day between flashes <laughs> of, of activity of some kind or another. Listen, we're joined now also by Mike Murphy. Mike, thank you so much for joining us. Your thoughts this morning, Mike? I'm Well, to tell you the truth, I've just heard the news and I'm shocked. I really am absolutely shocked. How did, what happened to him? He had... Cancer, apparently, yeah. Mike. You're kidding me. Yeah. Oh, God, isn't that just awful? I can't believe it. I really can't. I'm, I'm, I'm absolutely shocked. I am absolutely shocked about it because he was, he was so ebullient and so full of life and so full of energy and so full of pizzazz and positivity. I always felt, I mean, you don't think, is somebody going to slip away or are they, are they not? But I always felt Terry will simply just trundle on forever. And he was a bit like yourself, Gay. There was no stopping him. Like he was going to, whether they wanted him there or not, he was going to continue. <laughs> <laughs> you know? So I'm really taken aback. And I have to say, I'm so sorry for Helen, oh my God, and, and for his family, because I know how close they were. But uh, I, only, I only got the tag end of you, Brendan, there talking about, yeah, talking about Terry. And God, God be with the days when he was our boss. He used to, uh, when we, when we, I remember when we used to close down the station at 3 o'clock, uh, and we closed down between 3 and 5 o'clock, he said, we're yeah. signing off now. But he one night said, uh, one day said, but by the way, if you want some more music, the BBC Live programme is still on the air. They play some very nice music. <laughs> <laughs> but listen, I also, I don't know if you mentioned, I mean, Brendan, you were on there for a while, and I, when I joined, he was my boss, as, as indeed he was yours. And yeah, I, yeah. I was the junior announcer, and he was the senior announcer. But at that time, um, they used to organise what were laughingly called refresher courses <laughs> for the announcers. And uh, Terry would always pair himself with me. We kind of hit it off from the very beginning. And uh, he would always pair himself as the senior announcer taking a junior announcer for a refresher right, course yeah. to improve their Irish, to improve their presentation skills to improve their very personalities, <laughs> I think. And he would say to me, OK, we're on for a refresher on Thursday. I'll see you at 10 o'clock on the first tee at Edmundstown. <laughs> so we'd, we'd, and that's how the pair of us started playing golf. And we'd go up to Edmundstown, and on the first, first tee, he'd say to me, well, is there anything bothering you? No, not really, no. Right, I'll play you for a pound. And, <laughs> and off we would go. But he made his name, I think, on hospital's request, which is the only, if you like, room there was for a bit of, a bit of fun and Absolutely. jealousy. Absolutely, yeah, that's, that's right. true, because everything else is quite serious. Yes, I and remember, don't forget, yeah, don't forget he, he made the other breakthrough that you, the two of you are forgetting. He was the first one to be allowed to use his own name on a program, which was, was called he? Tarry a While. Yes, but never the Terry Wogan show, you will notice. Yeah, Terry never. a while, yeah. Terry a while. I don't, yeah, I don't even remember It was that. known as an obscure reference, but it got his name into it. Well, I, I did a sponsor program, but we both left the, 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 the staff around, uh, within a year of each other, and I was producing a sponsor program for Oliver Barry, who ironically was the originator of Century Radio, which Terry uh, subscribed to yes. many years later. But it was called Take It From Terry, and it was done in the style of a Radio Caroline, very noisy. We did it up at Avondale Studios. Yeah. Uh, noisy, jingles, loud music, uh, irreverent tone. And when Terry was moving from his doing Late Night Extra and Midday Spin on BBC Radio 2, the Olive program, and there was talk of him, could he move to Radio 1, the avant-garde pop show? And they said, no, not at all. He's, 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 he's more M.O.R. He's more, you know, lounge music man. And he used our tape of Take It From Terry done in Avondale to prove to the BBC he could be a pop DJ. And the, the thing about that sponsor program, there's a clip of it around. It's, uh, it, you, could, you could hear him shedding 
the, the, the dust of the GPO, more or less, are becoming uh, <laughs> uh, totally free. We used to do a strips yeah. farm, and then I said, unless I'm tired of doing strips, will you, will you just do a running order? And he just ad-libbed it. And he always yeah, said many years later yeah. that it takes a lot of flying hours to be able to open a microphone with nothing in your head and know yeah, something right. will come out. But I'll tell you something, though. I always maintained about Terry that he, uh, to, to me, he, I, I think, I mean, okay, Gay, you're kind of the established kind of number one broadcaster of the, the, the time in which you live sort of thing. But the fact is, Terry was just, the, in terms of language, he was the most creative presenter yes. I ever heard in my life. Yes. And the fact that he could do that, he could open the microphone and he could start to speak, but he had such an incredible command of language That's true. and he, he, you, he knew words he knew the Latin and the Greek derivatives I think you said that earlier on <laughs> right, yeah. he actually had an amazing command of language and I, I reckon that he was in terms of ad-libbing and in terms of off-the-cuff broadcasting he was without doubt the best ever in his generation here here here, here. I remember uh, one story from his more recent years in BBC, which, is, which I always thought was, uh, summed him up very well, because he, he had this huge command on, on the morning radio program. And Jimmy Young, you say to, about him that his, his listeners provide the material through their letters, and he puts them back in a book and sells it back to them. So, so he, always, he always got the, the material. But he was also, he, many, some years, not that many years ago, say 10, 12 years ago, uh, Daniel O'Donnell's management sent him a copy of his, Daniel's new single, and Terry played it on, on his morning program. And uh, his producer, Paul Waters, was called down to the controller of programs to be reprimanded. And the, the controller said to him, do you not realize that BBC Radio 2 has got a music policy? We are, we are rebranding. We do not play uh, Cliff Richard or, or Frank Sinatra. And we certainly do not play Daniel O'Donnell. Uh, we are going forward in a new musical strategy. Would you convey that to your presenter, Mr. Wogan? I said, I certainly will, Paul Waters. <laughs> <laughs> the following morning, um, Gay, our... our Terry played the record again. <laughs> and again, Paul Walter was called down to the office and said, did you tell Terry what I said? I did. Did you explain his, our new musical strategy going forward? I did. And what did he say? He said, he said tell him to fuck off. <laughs> <laughs> well, I tell you, you, you do remember, though, at that time in, in Radio Air and when we were all down there, the disapproval with which people like ourselves were regarded, and Terry was the ringleader in all of that. Yeah, yeah. And I do recall him getting into trouble on, on hospital's request, as you mentioned before. Why? Because he played a record in which the Clancy brothers sang the word bloody. Do you remember that? And he, uh, the well, it was even worse, the worse word than bloody, bloody, actually, because the, the, the song was, uh, it looked innocent on the LP, but Terry never played it beforehand. I was playing it for someone who was very, very sick. And the, the song title was, Isn't It Grand, Boys, To Be yeah. Bloody Well Dead. It was even worse well, than was bloody. It, yeah. it, was, it was actually... <laughs> 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 not not yeah. the one you play for hospital requests. That's right. We were answering the phone call for for, for, for the, the entire day with complaints coming in. <laughs> That's right. And and by the way, you were saying there about him uh, pouring the water. He did the same thing to me. I was I was in my first announcement about Shostakovich and, <laughs> and reading Radio Aaron. And I was really posh. I was doing my really best posh pitch. You know, my first announcement. I was shaking like a bloody leaf. Uh, sorry, bloody. I, oh my God, I hope I'm not a reprimand. Um, anyway, but anyway, and and uh, I caught, saw him out of the corner of my eye. He was supposed to be holding my hand, so to speak, as the kid was doing the announcement. And Shostakovich was born the son of a humble woodkeeper, woodcutter, <laughs> you know. <laughs> and, and I saw him kind of getting up and walking behind me. And he picked up the jug of water and poured it on my neck. And I mean, you do get a bit of a shock. You're live on the air. It you is, know? And, you, and you can't do anything about it very much. Yeah. <laughs> I can't believe he's... I, I really can't believe he's gone. I really can't. I'm so, so sad about it. So sad about it. And me too. So I, I leave you here, Miriam. Fond memories. Can, can I just mention, Miriam, please, yeah. that we are repeating A Meaning of Life tonight on RTE Television 1 at 10.30, which I did, I think, four years ago with okay. Terry. Oh. And, and he discloses himself more than most other times on it. So perhaps people might want to, want to watch that. Oh, they definitely yeah, that'd will. Yeah, be good. That'd be <clears> all right. Look, thank you to all three of you, Brendan, Gay and Mike. Thank you so hey, much Gay, for chatting to me this keep morning. Keep going yourself. We don't want <laughs> to... Gay, 
Gay. Yeah, hello. Are you there? I'm here. Could you, just, would you hang on as long as you can? Because <laughs> this Sunday morning, I don't want to be getting up every Sunday morning to do one of these. Okay? So would you, don't walk quite as far. And as regards that little program of yours in the afternoons on a Sunday, would you not, for God's sake, take a break from it? Give the listeners a break. At the end of March, I will give you all a break. And don't <laughs> laugh. It's coming sooner than you think. <laughs> You'll never give it up. He'll never Goodbye. give it up. Why, what are you Goodbye. doing at the end of March, Gay? What? What are you doing at the end of March? I'm, I'm finishing on Lyric FM at the end of March. Ah, don't mind him. I always finish at the end of March. Brendan, yeah, I'll be I'll be out to see in you October. in the pavilion. Brendan, yes, I'll be out to see you in the pavilion on Saturday night with Mike. Thank you very yeah, much. We're going on that. Saturday night. We'll, yeah, we'll, we'll be see there. you there, okay? Thank okay. you, Jordan. You should all do a show together, by the way. Thank you all very much for joining us. And we're calling your memories to pay tribute to Terry. We'll take a break. Welcome back. Well, we began this morning with obviously the very sad news of the passing of Terry Wogan. I've way too many messages to read out about the sadness of his passing but I am joined by Larry Gogan Larry thanks for coming into studio earlier on we've Mike Murphy Gay Byrne Brendan Balfe all talking about Gay and they mentioned you and how much he loved you well we were were very old friends we started actually the same day in, in RT yeah. Yeah. He, he was he was a staff announcer though. I, I was never a staff I was always <laughs> just, just a freelancer and, and we were friends ever since all right through all the years and, and particularly d- down the years in the, in the Eurovision because when I, when I went to do the first Eurovision that I did was in 1978 and he, he was already well known and, and um, I always remember the, fir- the first meeting they had these meetings of commentators where we had to give the pronunciation for the, the different songs for the different uh, countries and they were asking the different countries and then they said Yugoslavia and there was nobody from Yugoslavia and and Terry says, oh, the Irish commentator knows Yugoslavia perfectly. <laughs> that was me. <laughs> Put me on the spot. I had to make up these names. And he was full of, he was full of fun all the time. Yeah, oh, I loved him. He was a lovely fellow. And it's also, he went in and became so successful, mm. but he never lost the Limerick boy that he was. Sure he, wasn't. he remained the same type of guy. Oh, no, he never did. And when he, when he went at that, that time to England, that was, a, that was a big thing at the time here, that, that somebody would go to the BBC. And, and we all thought he was mad like, like, because, because he had a, a permanent job here. <laughs> and, and indeed, uh, Orchie just let him go. But then, then they didn't want him to go. They said oh, he couldn't go there and, and be mm. over here at the same time, as far as my memory serves me. And uh, he just gave up uh, the Irish one and went to full time over there and what, what, a, what a career he had what Incredible. a brilliant brilliant career I mean what do you think made him such a great broadcaster Larry? I think he was he was as he was he, he was as, as you found him he was just himself. He was always himself. Yeah. There was nothing put on about him. Nothing. And he had this beautiful voice, of course, first of all. He had the voice. And uh, and you have to have the voice, I suppose, first of all, for radio. Yeah. And he had this beautiful uh, voice. And, and he had a, he was a very intelligent fella, full of fun. And he was as quick as lightning, like with quips and things like that, you know. And they were saying earlier, actually, the trio of lads I had, that he used to play practical jokes a lot of pouring water down people's backs when they were trying to broadcast <laughs> and tying people's shoes together. He was obviously a great joker. Uh, he was a great joker. He did lots of that, that kind of stuff, all right. But uh, he never played the practical joke on me that, that I can remember. <laughs> but he, but he, he, was, he was full of fun. He was always in good humour, always. They all said, though, that he had an incredibly soft spot for you. They I said that know. this morning. We were great friends, all right. We got on very well together. He came a few years ago. I think it's about five years ago. They 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 would give me this award, and they they asked uh, they asked him would he come over, and he mm-hmm. says, "Oh yeah, I come over for Larry, all right." And I remember he, he came over, and it was a Friday, and they wanted him to go on the Late Late Show, you know. Mm-hmm. And and he says, "I oh, know, I'm over here to for Larry." And they said, "Should I bring him along?" He said, "No, no, I came over here to see Larry, and I'm seeing Larry." He was that kind of a fella. Like he was, he was, he did, he he, he just was friend and a, and a true friend. And obviously a great shock for you this morning. Too, oh, I couldn't, I couldn't believe it when I heard it. I couldn't believe it. Because, I mean, I'd, 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 I'd seen that he, he couldn't do children in need because they were saying he'd back problems or something, but I didn't know it was cancer. It's, it's terrible. Well, look, Larry, thank you so much for coming in this morning to really. remember Terry and all our listeners are saying what you're saying, how much they're going to miss him. Um, in my own case, he was on this programme a year ago and he was the same as he always was and he was so lovely and I remember being a young journalist in the BBC and he was incredibly kind to me. So, Eryesh J. Gareva on him. Thank you today on sound to Andrew Kane, to our producer, Alan Torney. I'll be here at the same time next Sunday. Until then, Mila Buichas Agaslan.